Hey, everybody. How are we? Are we good? Good. Okay. I'm very excited. Um, so, Pastor Reg um, has been speaking on a series of suffering. We've been talking a lot about suffering and seasons of suffering on Sundays. If you didn't know, now you know. And also, we have been talking about um, perseverance on First Tuesdays. So, I decided to take those themes on tonight and talk about the same perseverance, suffering, and so tonight I'm going to talk about marriage. Just kidding. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh there, but it's fine. <laughs> no, um, I, wanted, I want to share a story of the season I'm in right now, and I'm actually currently in a season of suffering, and that season is called baseball season. Um, it's been really tough for me, okay? It hits home, um, and... <laughs> okay, we're, we're ready now. We're ready. We're ready. Perfect. Um, but if, yeah, if you didn't know, if you lived under a rock, you, I will let you know that the Astros... and the Braves are in the World Series right now, okay? And I would not know that if I wasn't married to Darian. Like, I would not care. Um, but because, you know, when you get married, you have to do selfless things and be passionate about what your partner's passionate about, and that is baseball. And basketball and football and any Atlanta sport, Hawks, Falcons, what am I missing, Braves, the flames, all, I mean, all the, I know them all, okay? And I've been to every game, I feel like, but it's been really hard, and our household is under a lot of turmoil right now because it's like every inning, the anxiety is just like nail-biting, okay? Like the pacing up and down the hallway, like... If, if they're doing well, if the Braves are doing well, like, I have to, like, continue doing what I'm doing in that moment. Like, if I was on my phone, I better be on my phone, okay? Like, one time I went to the bathroom and the Braves started doing well, so I had to stay in the bathroom. Do not move. Do not move. Do not come out of the bathroom. I don't, wash your hands again, okay? There was one time where, game two, I remember game two, the Astros won. It was like a really bad win too. It was like 11 runs or something. It was actually pretty embarrassing. Um, but Darian was upset. Okay, upset is like an understatement of how he felt. And we went to bed and we did not speak. We did not speak about it. We went to bed. I was scrolling on my phone before bed, which you shouldn't do by the way, it's bad for your eyeballs. But I was scrolling on my phone and I hear this mumbling next to me and I'm like, Oakland, our dog, what's happening? And he goes, fully asleep, by the way. He goes, who pitched the ninth inning? I was like, what? I was like, I don't know. And he was like, who pitched the ninth? And I was like, Lee, I guess? I don't know, like I don't know the names of these baseball players. And he was like, well, I thought I would ask. Went straight back to sleep. And I was like, this is a lot for me. <laughs> this is no longer fun for me. I'm not having fun anymore, okay? And obviously tonight, like, I was more nervous about the game tonight than my sermon because I was like, if they lose tonight, if they lose tonight, just pray for me. Text me, please. Just your condolences because I'm thoroughly, thoroughly stressed out. It's been a season of suffering, okay? And I'm not being dramatic. It has been really hard. I mean, like, Oakland, our dog, poor thing, like when Darian starts yelling at the TV, he's like, oh my gosh, so, like we're gonna get hurt, like we're gonna get hurt. One time the cops were called because he was yelling at the TV, they thought they were, he was hurting me. And I'm just sitting on, the, I'm sitting on the couch with a coffee, just minding my own business. I'm like, no police officer, we're fine, he's just passionate, I don't know what to tell you. It, it's been a lot, okay, it's been a lot. It's been a season of suffering. And here's the thing. I think, although that is funny, we all have a season of suffering that we are currently in or we just got out of or we're about to go into, whether we know it or not, right? Like, in our marriage and in our ministry, let me just share with you some sufferings. And this is not me being like, oh, feel bad for me, please. No, it's like I can relate 
like life happens and sometimes it's not great. And so when we first got married, our wedding was canceled, pandemic. We were like the first wedding ever canceled. My heart was broken. I was like, oh my gosh. I was supposed to marry the man of my dreams, and now we're getting married in a house. Not ideal, right? Not ideal. Then two months later, our car gets stolen. Okay, that was a really tough time. Genuinely not ideal. Uh, then after that, racial tensions started happening around in May, and that was really tough because, you know, in a racial marriage, like how do we, do we have these conversations with one another? Like what should I ask? What should I not ask? Like it, it was really challenging for us. Um, then two months later to get super serious, I ended up having a miscarriage, which was very unforeseen. And that was really hard. Entered into a time of depression and anxiety, a job change, financial instability, a car wreck, like the list could go on. And I know right now as I'm telling you my list, like you are taking note of your list, right? Like we all have seasons of suffering. And I think that a lot of times our go-to is to get super upset with God, like super upset and being like, God, what? Like me, me, why me? Like why am I having to go through this suffering? But suffering's promised, right? John 16 it says, have I not told you these things so that in me you may have peace? In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Hold on. Don't let go. Don't quit. Persevere. Because I have overcome the world. It's like he's saying like, it's so interesting. Have, I have told you these things. Like, have I not told you? It's like, them back then, like the disciples back then, were like, oh, me? Why me? And God's like, I, Jesus is like, I told you. Like, I, have I not told you? There will be troubles. There will be suffering in this life. But hold on. Take heart. Persevere. Keep pushing. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight is like, why, why should we persevere through the suffering? Like, what's the point? It'd be easier to just give up. Like genuinely, it would just be easier to like, oh, well, that one's not working out for me. Oh, my faith is getting hard. Oh, that relationship's not working out. I'm just going to peace. And this generation, and I'm included, our generation, I feel like we really struggle with this concept of pushing through things. Like getting a little bit gritty. Persevering through the tough times. So hopefully tonight, I can encourage you. The Holy Spirit, help me, Lord Jesus, um, to encourage you that persevering through your suffering is worth it. And that's what we're going to talk about it. So I think where we should start is the definition of perseverance. I'm sure you already know it because you're all very smart, but I'm going to read it. It says, perseverance is continued effort to do or to achieve something despite difficulties. Ew, that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> that's not sexy. No, thank you. Tried her on, did not buy her. Like, no, I don't want that. I don't want perseverance. That, that sounds hard. That sounds like effort. It sounds like hard work. Yeah, you need it. We need it. I need it. In my marriage, in my job, in my friendships, in my relationship with my mom, being honest, I need it, right? Perseverance is not Instagrammable, yeah? Like, we are not like, oh, persevering over here, hey. No, we don't show that. We don't even like to talk about it. We don't even like to share that with our closest friends. But it is inevitably going to happen. You are inevitably going to have to say no to your flesh at some point. If you're following Jesus, you're going to have to say no. But the no leads to a yes, but you're gonna to have to persevere through the transition. And that's where I feel like I lose some of you. Where we lose some of you is in that transition of saying, okay, I'm gonna push through this to get to the other side. And some of you just quit. And my husband always tells me, if you don't quit, you win. A plus B equals C, if you don't quit, you win. And I wanna win. 
I want to win and I want you to win. So tonight we're going to talk about an Old Testament historic story, Old Testament, we're really going for it, um, about perseverance and what the outcome of perseverance was. So we're going to actually head to the book of Ezra. Some of you probably don't even know there was a book of Ezra, but there is. Okay, so we're going to dive into Ezra chapter 1. We're also going through Ezra into Nehemiah because I found out through my one hour and nine minute seminary YouTube video that I watched to study for this. I found out that you can't read both separately. You have to put them together to make sense. So we're going we're gonna to do that. Okay, Ezra 1, six verses, stay with me. It says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says, quotes, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go to Jerusalem in Judah, and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold. So we're getting paid, y'all, with goods and livestock and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Verse 6, all their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver, silver and gold, with goods and livestock and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. Okay, that was a lot. Deep breath. Background. Here's a spark noted version for you. So, in this time, in this day and age, Jerusalem was destroyed like completely by Babylon. Yeah, we know that. Babylon, they were super powerful back in the day, and God allowed Babylon to take over Jerusalem. So, so sad, right? The Israelites had to go into exile in Babylon. They weren't allowed to go back to their destroyed land, and now God has placed this movement in the king's heart. King Cyrus, who is king of Babylon. Um, and so the king is like, okay, I am going to give the Israelites everything that they need to go back to their country and rebuild, redo, retry. Yeah, so it's, it's like Christmas Day for the Israelites here. Like, the Israelites probably are thinking, because they know the word. They know the word of God. They know the Torah. They understand that one day, because prophets have said this, that one day the Messiah is going to come back, and they're going to build the temple, and God's presence is going to reside, and the Messiah, whoever that is, they don't, they're not sure yet, the Messiah is going to come back, and it's going to be a revival. So they're like, oh, this is it. Here we go. This is the time where the Messiah comes back. This is, is this happening right now? Like the anticipation is building and they're bringing Israelites back into their nation. It's like very good day for the Israelites. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the three things that the Israelites come to rebuild. And number one is the dwelling. The dwelling. So you can write that down. Put it in your journal, notes, the dwelling, which is the temple, right? So Ezra 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of somebody, and his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, everybody say Zerubbabel, that's him, son of whoever, and his associates began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it. That's what they did back then. It's weird. I know. In accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God, despite their fear of the peoples around them, catch this, despite the fear of the peoples around them, 
they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. So we're talking about Zerubbabel, yes, which his name actually means planted in Babylon. Fun fact, thought I would share. But he comes for the sole purpose of rebuilding the temple. Yeah, and he comes with a crew. He's like, let's go, people. Let's rebuild this temple. Let's make it bigger, better than ever. Let's sacrifice all these animals on here so that God can come and his cloud, his holy presence cloud thing that's really cool in the Old Testament comes and resides in this temple. So let's make it pretty. So they do. And they successfully build, rebuild the temple. Like We're not talking about like a little uh, two-bedroom, one-bath house. Like a temple, okay, probably very large. Larger than my apartment complex, probably. And they did it despite everyone's fear around them. Okay, and now we start losing some people in the audience. Despite everyone's fear around them. So people were saying things about them, probably. Oh, why are they rebuilding it? It was torn down for a reason, right? I'm sure you could, like, picture, like, people, like, small talking, like, mm, I'm not going there. I'm not going to that church. Nope, right? And I feel like this is where I lose some people in the audience because then it, it's no longer easy. It's no longer fun. At first, it was fun. Let's build together. Let's make an assembly line. Here's a brick. Here's a stone, right? But then people start talking, and you're like, ooh, this is kind of unpopular now. I should dip. But they don't. They persevere through that, and they keep building. So when Zerubbabel rebuilds the temple, the cloud of God's presence is supposed to come down, right? That's what's supposed to happen. Well, it doesn't. Anticlimactic. It doesn't. God's presence doesn't come down. And they're like, what, 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 what? They're looking at each other like, what in the world? What happened? Okay, well, let's just try again. Let's, let's put some more animals on the altar. Let's kill some more animals. I'm like, this is red flag. Stop killing animals. But they're just like, let's kill some more animals. Let's decorate it a little bit more. Maybe he'll get, and it doesn't ever show up. What? What? God, you literally told the king, like, you pressed on his heart for us to come and build the temple. I'm doing, I literally left Babylon to come back to nothing to rebuild for you, God, and you didn't show up? Rude. Why me? I'm doing everything right. I'm being obedient. Why haven't you shown up in my life? Relatable, right? Number two, the directions. So we have the temple, the dwelling. Then we have the directions, the Torah. Ezra 7, verse 6, this Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher, well-versed, very intelligent, in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given, the king had granted him everything he asked for. Again, had all the resources, had a bag, ready to go. He's ready. For the hand of the Lord, his God, was on him. So this is important because it wasn't just some random guy who was trying to, you know, teach people about the commandments. No, like he was intelligent and he, his, the God had his hand on him. So it's supposed to work, right? Well, let's keep reading. Ezra comes to rebuild the community, right? So we have Zerubbabel that's trying to rebuild the temple. Didn't work out too well. Ezra is coming to rebuild the community and replant the Torah in the Israelites' hearts because at this moment, that's what they had to follow, okay? So Ezra 7, 25 through 28, and you, Ezra, in accordance with the wisdom of your God, which you possess, Appoint magistrates and judges to the administer justice to all the people of trans Euphrates, all who know the laws of your God, and you are to teach any who do not know them. Whoever does not obey the law of your God and the law of the king must surely be punished by death, banishment, confiscation of property, or imprisonment. Yikes. Praise be to the Lord, Ezra says. Praise be to God. The God of our ancestors, who has put it in the king's heart to bring honor to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way. 
And who has extended his good favor to me before the king and his advisors and all the king's powerful officials because the hand of the Lord my God was on me. I took courage, Ezra says, and gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me. So Ezra was fully equipped to go, right? Like this is not like some low budget missionary <laughs> uh, vacation travel expenditure. Like it's like they gave him everything he needed. He was fully equipped. We understand God's hand was on him. We've read it a bunch of times. He made sure to say it again. And guess what? He goes into the community in Jerusalem, tries to rebuild the commandments, tries to implant the, the rules, the Torah, back into the hearts of the Israelite people. And guess what? They violate it. They violate it. In Ezra actually fell to the insecurity of, well, what are the Jerusalem leaders going to think of me? And made some weird, like, you can't get divorced, but you also have to get divorced because if an Israelite doesn't marry an Israelite, it was like kind of messy. And that's not what God intended. And so they ended up violating this Torah. So what does that mean? Did I just waste my time? I studied, I'm sure, years. I, I studied for years, fully equipped to teach the word of God, and they violate it? God, why me? Why me, God? I'm doing what you are asking me to do. The temple and now the Torah? What's happening? We're doing everything you've asked us to do. We're being obedient, and you're not showing up. Number three, the divider. Nehemiah, like I said, Ezra and Nehemiah are together. So we're continuing the story. Nehemiah 2, verses 11 through 12. Are we, are we here? Are we still here? Okay, great. I went to Jerusalem, Nehemiah says, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. Wise. Because at this point, everyone thinks that they're jokes. Like, bro, your God's not coming. Okay. So he waits. Nehemiah waits to tell the people what's happening. Then in verse 17, it says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in the ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, Let's start. Let's do it. Sounds good to me. So they began the good work. So Nehemiah, who is also called by God, his hand, God's hand, right, was on him tries to rebuild the wall, the divider, for protection from other nations, right? And guess what? Later down the story, you get this theme, right? Like, it doesn't work out. <laughs> um, the Israelites actually set up shop on the wall and work on the Sabbath. So that's violated. The wall actually means nothing now. What? What? Like, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, they're all trying their best, right? They're all trying their best to follow Jesus. And what did they, what, what's, the, what's the result? It's sad, right? You want to know the happy ending? There's not one. There's no happy ending. There's not, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's not one. The ending, they actually hold a revival because they're like, oh, surely God will come. They hold a revival so that the Israelites can, like, repent of their sins and, like, try better and vow to, like, not mess up anymore and follow the Torah. They have this great celebration, and this should be the turning point, and it's not. God doesn't show up. Zerubbabel's, Zerubbabel, Zubi, his work was undone. They violated the temple. The dwelling place. Ezra, his work was undone. They didn't care about the Torah. They didn't really want it. Nehemiah, his work was undone because people were thrifting at the wall on the Sabbath watching you, Matt. Okay, so why, why would I share this story to you? It's pretty anticlimactic, pretty like, Meh. dang, I could have got it right and they didn't because that's life. That's, li that's your life. That's my life. That's our life. 
You know, we just, we, we go through life trying our very best. I'm trying my very best to do what the Lord has asked me to do, try not to sin, try to read my Bible, pray, try to preach a message, hopefully it's making sense. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. But it probably won't work out because of this distorted intent of the human heart. That's the issue. Sin, the distorted intent of the human heart. And it's a story, this is a story of how well-intentioned leaders, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, very equipped, very intelligent, very like ready to go, they tried to generate the human heart to desire God. And guess what? You can't do that. You can't do that. Only the Holy Spirit can generate the renewal of a human heart. They were trying to be something that they cannot be and then expecting God to show up in it. And it was a good work. It was a good thing. It was a good thing, right? They were rebuilding Jerusalem. But a good thing can turn bad with bad intentions. And if you don't get anything from this sermon, if you're like, I don't give a care about Ezra, Zerubbabel, or Nehemiah, that's okay. But right here, this is the point I want to make. Perseverance without the power of the Holy Spirit is purposeless. And if you have been living a life of, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to try harder, but the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is not in your life, you are living a purposeless life. And I'm sorry to tell you, but I have to. And that, I almost said, sucks. I'm not gonna say that, I just said it. But like, that's unfortunate, right? That's unfortunate. You cannot strive to get to the Savior. You have to receive His gift of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit's power mixes in with your perseverance, ooh, money, home run. <laughs> right what's it called when like all three bases are loaded and they hit a home run grand slam grand slam perseverance with the power of the Holy Spirit grand slam purpose happens things start to make sense and guess what the suffering still is there because that's promised right John 16 promised God promises a lot of things he also promises suffering but guess what you persevering through the suffering with the power of the Holy Spirit makes you new. Makes you new. And I'm actually gonna talk about these plants that we've been talking about, Eddie, if you can come up with my plants. But here's the thing, while he's getting the plants, I wanna share this quick story. Because I cannot stand up here and preach this message without sharing that I've, I've gone through this purposeless perseverance without the power of the Holy Spirit. And when I was, I turned 19, three days later I get on a plane. This is a true story. And I'm gonna try not to cry. But three days later I get on a plane after working six months, I worked three jobs for six months, saving every single penny I had because I felt like the Lord called me to Australia. I felt like the Lord called me to Hillsong. I felt like I was doing a good thing. I was doing a good thing. I was serving the Lord. And I remember I had so much time on the 19 hour flight <laughs> that I started talking to God and I just was like, God, it's just you and me. Like I'm going to a different country, literally no, not a single soul. It's just you and me, God, let's do it. Me and you versus the world. I get off the plane, I get all my bags, I go to the church, they give me my key, I get settled in. I'm like, this is great. And then I meet a boy. And the problem was it wasn't Darian, so that's the root issue about that one. But it wasn't Darian, it was a different boy. And I thought that I was gonna spend the rest of my life with him. And when you're in a different country by yourself, you cling to anything that feels like home. And I did. And it got toxic real fast. And the manipulation started, the spiritual abuse started, this codependency that was so toxic started. 
and I was in my second year of college. And I remember just being in this horrible relationship. And I wanted to give up so badly on God. Why me? I can't, I flew all the way across the world for you. I'm here like at Bible college to learn about your word. Like why me, why am I going through this? And I remember I was in a preaching seminar and I remember the Holy Spirit said, Carly, you left me at the airport. I had left him at the airport. And not to say that that time was a waste, but can you imagine what it would look like if I brought him with me? Gosh, I had left him at the airport and I had clung to what was comfortable and I had settled for less than God's best for me. And we have these plans, <laughs> these stupid plans, I hate them so much. <laughs> and I have been watering them every stupid day. And look, nothing, nothing. <laughs> I don't know what I did <laughs> wrong. I went to Ellis Pottery, and that's the good stuff, you know, Ellis Pottery on Calder. And I put seeds in there and I got the correct soil and I was, my nose is running. The sun was on it and I was watering it and nothing. This is supposed to be the good soil. There's supposed to be a plant in here. Nothing. And it was a good thing that turned bad. And this is our life. We're doing everything right, probably. You know, we mess up along the way, but we're trying. We sin every now and then, but we ask for forgiveness. We pray, we journal, we show up on a Sunday, we serve on the greeter team, but yet this, nothing. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. He uproots, sorry, stage team. He uproots the, old good soil that's now bad which is hard right feels like you're being torn apart feels like things are being stripped away from you feels like you're all alone in this space with no soil there's a little bit of soil but it's okay right but then the holy spirit comes in when you invite him and he says, not only am I going to give you good soil, I'm going to give you the whole plant. I'm going to give you the whole freaking plant. <laughs> because my power now resides in you. And in that suffering, and in your weakness, there is a glory that is happening. It says in Romans 5, 3 through 4, and the band can come up. I promise I'm almost done. Romans 5, 4, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand currently, in which we now currently stand in the grace of God, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Right here, verse 3. Not only so, but we also have glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance produces character and character produces hope paul is writing this and he could have used any other word verse three we have not only so but we have glory in our sufferings he could have said kindness he could have said strength we have strength in our suffering no he used the word glory and you know what glory means holiness what? <laughs> so what you're saying is with the power of the Holy Spirit through our suffering, we're made more holy? Oh, that's worth it. 
that's worth it. Remember that list that I had? That long list of sufferings? That pandemic that ruined our wedding? The Holy Spirit used that to give me the most intimate, and some of you in this room were there, the most intimate wedding I've ever been a part of. The Holy Spirit was so, it was like a worship set, but like for my wedding. And it, we were on our knees, we were bawling our eyes out, and we were in the middle of a pandemic. Remember those racial tensions I talked to you about? That was really hard. The Holy Spirit used that, made it holy as he does. And he actually created an opportunity for our church to begin this conversation of reconciliation. You know that miscarriage I talked to you about? That was very hard. One of the hardest, the probably hardest thing I've ever been through. The Holy Spirit used that to help me understand that I actually have never believed that God is good. I had a disbelief in God's goodness. And through a miscarriage, God revealed this Holy Spirit helped me to see, hey, you, you, you actually don't believe that I'm good. And now I stand here with full faith that God's goodness is the only thing I want. And I believe strongly that it is for you and it is for me and that it is pure and it is not ending. You know that season of depression and anxiety that I talked to you about? I mean, I was in it, went through it. It, whew, it's very close, very close to my heart. But the Holy Spirit used that to reveal in me that there is so much to be thankful for. Gratefulness is the opposite of anxiety. And I would have never known that. And now I'm in this process currently of retraining my brain. And it's beautiful and it's hard, but I'm so thankful because when I do have that healthy baby one day, in Jesus' name, I'm gonna be the best mom. <laughs> I'm gonna be the best mom because I have worked so hard on my mental health, my emotional health, my spiritual health. And I am the strongest Carly that I've ever been currently. And the Holy Spirit used that. And the Holy Spirit wants to use your suffering too. He wants to, but you have to let him in. He's a, he's a gentleman. He's not gonna barge in and uproot and replant. Like this is not gonna happen overnight. But it's for you. His grace is sufficient for you. And I don't know what, I'm so over right now, but I don't know what the season of suffering is. Oh God, Jesus. <laughs> Maria. You have to let go. You have to let go. Because as soon as you do, this is gonna happen. It's your portion. It's his plan for you. It's your future. Jacqueline, your obedience is not being looked over. He sees you. And it feels a whole lot like suffering. I know it does, girl. I know it does. But he sees you. And when you wake up, I'm not kidding, when you wake up in the morning, he is excited. He is excited. And he is ready because he knows that you're ready. You have to keep pushing. You have to keep moving forward because if you don't quit, you win. You win. 
And the greatest, I'm done, the, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. The greatest example of perseverance is Jesus, right? The greatest example, he comes down blameless, not a sin in sight, but yet dies for sin, our sin, your sin. It doesn't make sense. He suffered a lot, more than we probably will ever have in this entire life for you for you and it doesn't the story doesn't stop there because he resurrects because the power of the holy spirit was in his perseverance and it it came and turned into purpose and he resurrected from the actual dead and now he has victory over sin and because he died for our sin we now have his victory and we can and will in jesus name persevere through this life until we see him again face to face, yes? We have to. Do not give yourself the option to quit. It is worth it. There is power, there is strength, there is purpose. His church was defiled, it is currently, right? It's hard to do community. His commandments broken. <laughs> we can't get it right. You know? But the Holy Spirit showed up on the third day for you. For you. For you, Bree. He showed up for you. Ruth, he showed up for you. Zach, Sage, he showed up for us so that we could resurrect. So that when he leaves this earth, he didn't leave us alone. He gave us his Holy Spirit and we have to like tune in, tune in. Because the word that I got from God for 2021, what year is it, 2021? The word I got from God this year is more. Ephesians 3.20, there will be more. Then we can think, ask, or imagine there will be more probably more suffering <laughs> but there will be more and you don't get to quit during the more because it's worth it amen it's worth it there's purpose you have purpose let's stand up because if you don't stand up I'm gonna keep talking this generation is powerful our generation is lit okay we're really cool and we have a lot of great qualities about us but we need to invite the Holy Spirit into it because if when when we do not if because we will when we do we're going to see shackles broken chains falling like hands raised that have never been able to raise before so let's, let's do it right now. Let's start right now. Not tomorrow. Let, I'm here. You're here. Let's just do it. Lord Jesus, we're going to pray right now. Jesus, we invite you genuinely, authentically into our hearts right now. Will you uproot? I know this is a scary prayer. Just go with me. Will you uproot, Lord, all of the things that are not of you right now in Jesus' name? And when you, will you replant a new heart in us, a new heart? a new love, a new desire, a new discipline, God. Will you replant your Holy Spirit into our heart, Lord? And as we be continue to walk, as we continue to persevere, will you bring purpose in it? Will you help us see? Will you tune our eyes, tune our ears, tune our hearts to you, Lord? And we ask this genuinely, genuinely, Please, we need you, Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen.